So, that's section one, which is about the physics. Now I want to talk to you about my other book. In this copy, it's called The Role of Evil in Human Evolution, but I've rewritten the work, and it's available only as an e-book, which you can get again by emailing me and asking for a copy, called If the Truth Be Known. Now, I believe that what 2012 is, is the ascension, the mass ascension of humanity. And what is that ascension? Well, I've talked about the possibility of increasing the speed of energy in every atom of the body, so the body can disappear out of space-time. And if you read it in the Bible, Jesus says, you know, that two in the field, one is taken and one is left behind. Three women at the mill, one is taken, one is left behind. So there could come a time when people literally vanish off the surface of the earth in an ascension process. My physics allows for that possibility. And in fact, you would use teleportation beams from a fifth dimensional light ship in another space time. You surround the whole body in a beam and you just basically the resonance causes the speed of energy within the body to go to the speed of energy of the beam. Bingo, the body's gone. And in fact, the whole of the Earth is coming under the influence of a fifth dimensional beam called the photon belt. So, there's a lot of talk about physical ascension, again, which fits with the physics. But, the way I see it, is very much that mass human consciousness is shifting exponentially. More and more people are waking up. They're going through a transition in their understanding. And we're now hitting this curve. And I reckon in the last six months of 2012, it will just go to a point where there is time, there is consciousness, and the curve is going like so, and you see time doesn't matter. The whole of humanity will shift in consciousness over a very short period of time. And as we accelerate toward the end of 2012, we will have shifted in consciousness to such an extent doesn't matter what happens to the Earth. We won't be worried if there are earthquakes or if the Earth is going through some sort of transition. We will have woken up into our divine state, into our God state. We'll, we'll have woken up to the fact with the bloke on the beach that all the galaxies are just the cells of our bodies. We won't be worried about a little tiny planet, in a sense. And yet we'll be here in an infinite state with the infinite potential to sort the planet out because we can dream it different. You see the huge potential of human awakening in consciousness. We get very caught up in physicality. However, in order to earn that ascension, we've got to do a little bit more than breathe. Because the ascension is under threat. There are forces that would like to see that curve go flop. In other words, as the curve goes round, it goes flop. And the greatest threat to the ascension process is religion. Fanatical religion. That's surprising. You'd think that the religious people would really be the major forces for the transition, spiritual transition of humanity. But it's never been the case. Remember, religions have always persecuted the prophets. They crucified Christ. Okay? And it's especially that group that crucified Christ I want to talk about. Between 2,600 and 3,000 years ago, there was a slaughterhouse, an abattoir built on Mount Moriah, where Jerusalem now stands, by Solomon, the first temple of Solomon. And if you read the Bible, thousands of animals were slaughtered there. That temple was destroyed 2,600 years ago when the uh, Hebrews, when Solomon's Israel was invaded by Nebuchadnezzar, by the Babylonians. And the group of Masons who were responsible for the temple vowed that they would rebuild that temple and they would rebuild it again and again and they would make sure the temple always stands. 
And this is the danger of religion. Instead of letting go, religion hangs on to the past. Blood sacrifice does not belong in the future. It was a thing of the past. And for a group of people to be fanatically determined to renew this practice of blood sacrifice could destroy the earth. We saw what happened to the Aztecs with their procedures of black blood sacrifice. It enabled Cortes and 500 uh, conquistadors to take over the whole of the Americas. So it's total anathema to humanity. However, the Temple of Solomon was rebuilt. The second build, build of the temple occurred when the Israelites returned to their land by Herod the Great. And that was in the time of Christ. But then, 70 years after Christ, the second temple was destroyed. And the temple builders, the masons, went underground and were determined to rebuild the temple. And one of the first things they did was to hijack Christianity through one of their adjunctor specialists, one of their plants, a chap called Saul, who got renamed Paul. Okay, so the Christian religion became very much Pauline rather than centred on Christ. It was more Paul's ideas. And then, of course, Constantine, the Roman emperor, established it as a state religion. Now, we see in the Middle Ages this group, very, very powerful people, they call themselves Zionists, because Zion is the name that's given to Mount Moriah, it's important to these people because that's where Abraham offered his son in sacrifice. But remember, when we talk about Abraham and the sacrifice, if you read the Bible, it says, offer your son, your only son, for sacrifice. The angel says it twice. The only time that Abraham had an only son is when he had Ishmael. As soon as he had Isaac, he had two sons. So that's the clue. The son that was offered the sacrifice was not Isaac. It was Ishmael. Now, all of, all of us in this Christian country, we go to church and we get out our, Drus, our St. James Bibles in the Anglican church or the Catholic church and we read Isaac. But if you go to the Muslim countries, they'll all tell you it's Ishmael. So it's propaganda. Who do you believe? Well, again, the Bible says your only son. So it's very important. Mount Moriah, where Abraham offered his son in sacrifice, which is the place of the blood sacrifice, rightfully belongs to the Muslims, not the Jews. And you see that now, Mount Moriah is protected by the, by the Dome of the Rock, the second most sacred shrine of Islam. And very, very important, I'm going to talk quite a bit about the Dome of the Rock. It's the most beautiful golden dome, and it tells us what to do. This is the great hint in that structure, to humanity, how to save the world. From Armageddon. So we're going to go now through the, the history. What do we see? We suddenly see the appearance of the Crusades, of where the Catholic Church is being manipulated, and the, the monarchs are being manipulated to whip up the fervour, and everyone goes charging off with Richard the Lionheart, etc. They all go charging off to capture Jerusalem. But they can't beat the Muslims. Saladin whips them and drives them out. So the next thing we see is that Knights Templar, who were the main driving force of the Crusades, the most powerful people in the group in Europe, had all the wealth, had all the banks. A pound of silver is a Knight Templar concept. Temple, 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 temple. Hints in the name. They disappear. They're wiped out in France by Philip the Fair. And what do we see appear in their place? Freemasonry. Because the Zionists, the people, and I'm not talking about the Jews, I'm not anti-Semitic because I'll tell you who's anti-Semitic, the Zionists. They're the enemy of the Jewish people. There ever was a group that's anti-Semitic. It's the Zionists. And the Zionists are Christians, Freemasons, and also Jews. So it's... Be clear... They talk about, they use anti-Semitism to try to stop people like me talking about them. So the first thing that happened is that they got rid of the Knights Templar because they realised they couldn't just take armies into 
the Islamic world. The Islamic world is just too strong. They've got to develop a much greater strategy. They've got to turn the whole of the West against Islam. They've got to find some way of turning the whole of Christendom against Islam. And so they started to work through this group, the Freemasons. And when you actually study Freemasonry, they're absolutely obsessed with the Temple of Solomon. All their rights are based on the temple. They've got the pillars of the temple. They've got, they're, they're going on about Hiram Abif, who was the original designer of Solomon's temple. And all their rituals, you know, they've got the, they're reiterating the wages that the apprentices got, etc., etc. But there's a very interesting thing. If you look at the Masons, you notice they've got aprons and long gloves going up their arms. Those are the apparel of slaughtermen. The men in the original temple of Solomon were slaughtermen. They wore aprons and long gloves because they were busy slaughtering animals. If you go to the Dome of the Rock in Jerusalem today, the guides will show you the channels carved in the Rock of Moriah where the blood ran in streams from the animals that they slaughtered. So let's be clear about this temple. Let's not use the word temple. Let's use the word slaughterhouse. Because they are determined to build the third temple of Solomon. And the whole future of the world hinges on that obsession. When you study this group, you find they, are, they operate through an organisation called the Illuminati. You may have heard of the Illuminati. The secret government. They're responsible for engineering the French Revolution. They control all the banks. They control in industry. They're responsible for the Russian Revolution and the First World War. For them, the slaughter of the flower of young men is just past the blood sacrifice. That changed the frontiers of the world. It gave them more opportunity for control of the Middle East so that they could fulfill their goal of rebuilding that temple. Then the Second World War, that's very, very interesting. Again, engineered for their purpose. Who was Adolf Hitler? Well, it turns out that his grandmother was a serving maid in the house of Rothschild, and that Rothschild had a habit of in and out of the girls' beds like a mountain goat. So it could have been that the grandfather of Adolf Hitler was one of the Rothschilds. And the thing about it is when you really study the facts, it looks as though the Germans were funded by the Americans. By that chemical organisation called Faber. And also, the, the, the six million Jews who were slaughtered were sacrificed. And that prepared the way for the first prediction of the end, which is the re-establishment of the Holy Land, of the, of the State of Israel, the Jewish people getting their homeland back. And also, thanks to the Holocaust, no one dare speak out against this group. Otherwise, they're accused of anti-Semitism. When in fact, this is not Jewish. These are not the Jewish people. These are the enemy of the Jewish people. Be really clear about this. This group, believe it or not, are called the Pharisees. It's a cult. They were the Masons in Jesus' time. So, the second prediction of the end is when the people of Israel, the Jewish people of Israel, actually re-secure Jerusalem. And the third prediction of the end is the rebuilding of the Temple of Solomon, the building of the Third Temple, and that coincides with Armageddon. Now, it's come to my attention that Armageddon isn't a coincidence